Hi everybody, welcome to the third and final part of the Magic Rules Iceberg Explained. I'm sure this is what you've all been waiting for. This is where we get into Magic's most bizarre and counterintuitive rulings of all. If you haven't seen parts one and two, there will be a link to them in the description below. Watching them is not strictly necessary to understanding this part, but it might give some additional context to some of these entries. The description also contains a link to the original Iceberg post on Reddit. Even more so than in parts 1 and 2, I've put in a lot of research to make sure the information in this video is correct. However, it is possible I've overlooked something, so if you notice any mistakes, please point them out in the comments. With that out of the way, let's continue from where we left off at the end of part 2. Wishes don't work under Mind Slaver. If you are controlling another player, you cannot look at that player's sideboard. Since you can't look at their sideboard, you cannot be sure that you are selecting a card of the correct type, so you cannot get a card from their sideboard. An exception to this is Death Wish, which can get a card of any type, so it still kind of works. You can still select a card from their sideboard, but you don't get to look at the sideboard, making it effectively random. Clean up step loops. Normally players can't play spells or use activated abilities during the cleanup step, but if an action occurs during the cleanup step that causes a triggered ability to trigger, that ability will go onto the stack and players will have a chance to respond to it. If this happens, there will be another cleanup step afterwards. This can sometimes lead to loops of abilities repeatedly triggering during the cleanup step. A common example of this is with the Gitrog monster. If you have the Gitrog monster in play and have to discard down to your hand size at the end of turn and you discard a land, this will trigger the Gitrog monster's ability and cause you to draw a card. There will then be another cleanup step and since you drew a card after discarding down to your hand size limit, you will still have too many cards in your hand and have to discard down to hand size limit again. This will continue happening until you discard a non-land card. Ozolith's text is wrong. The wording on the card suggests that the counters get moved from the creature onto the Ozolith. What actually happens is that new counters are placed on the Ozolith that are copies of the counters on the creature. There are at least two instances I could find where this is important. If you manage to get two Ozoliths in play, such as with Mirror Gallery, then both Ozoliths will get copies of the counters placed onto them. It also matters in the case of Skullbriar. The Skullbriar will keep the counters on it, and the Ozolith will get copies of those counters placed onto it. Burning of Shinye versus Darksteel Citadel. During the resolution of a spell, if you are asked to make a choice, you cannot make a choice that is impossible. Since Darksteel Citadel is indestructible, you cannot choose to destroy it during the resolution of Burning of Shinye. This is different from targeting indestructible permanents with spells that will destroy them. As long as they meet any targeting restrictions of the spell, they are legal targets. Limited Range of Influence Limited Range of Influence is a rule that is used in certain multiplayer games. A limited range of influence determines which other players you can interact with. You cannot interact with players outside of your range of influence so you cannot attack them or target them or permanents they control, and even spells or abilities which don't target will not affect players outside of your range of influence. For example, if a game has a range of influence of 1, then you can only attack a player that is within one seat of you, in other words, the players immediately left or right of you. And in this game, if you cast a spell like Wrath of God, it will affect you, and the players immediately next to you, but will not affect any players outside of that range. Some tokens can be named with Pithing Needle. Pithing Needle requires you to name a card, and you cannot normally name a token this way. However, if a token happens to have the same name as a card, then you can name the card, and Pithing Needle will stop activated abilities from that token. For example, because there is a card called Shapeshifter, you can name Shapeshifter with Pithing Needle, and the Pithing Needle will stop any activated abilities from the Shapeshifter tokens made by Crib Swap. Although, note, you can only name a card that is legal in the format you are playing. So if you are playing Modern, for example, you cannot name Shapeshifter because it's not legal in Modern. 
Processing damage. There are four steps to processing damage. First, if an effect allows excess damage to be dealt to another permanent or to a player, then the damage is divided accordingly. Second, any replacement effects or damage prevention effects modify the damage, and abilities that trigger when damage is dealt now trigger. Third, damage that has been dealt is processed into results. This means things like damage dealt to a player causes loss of life, or damage that's dealt to a planeswalker will cause loyalty counters to be removed from that planeswalker. And finally, the damage event occurs. Graveyard order matters. Some older cards care about the order of cards in the graveyard. This could mean caring about other cards being on top of them in the graveyard, or caring about the top or bottom card of a graveyard. Because of this, the rules state that you are not allowed to change the order of cards in your graveyard. However, no cards have been printed that care about the order of the graveyard since Stronghold in 1998. So in formats where only newer cards are legal, there is a special ruling that you may change the order of your graveyard at any time you want. Sarpedian Empires Volume 7 Errata Originally, this card's name was officially italicized. However, it has since received errata to be in regular upright text. This is the only case where the formatting of a card's name has officially been errated. Mage of Jalfir and Dryad Arbor. Teferi grants flash to all creature cards not currently in play. In the case of Dryad Arbor, it allows you to play the card at instant speed, however it does not override other rules for playing lands, so you can still only play it during your own turn, and only if you still have land drops available. Linked Abilities Linked Abilities are two abilities on the same card, where choices made for one ability influence the other. An example of this is Voice of All, the ability that makes you choose a colour when it enters play is linked with the ability that grants it protection, because the choice from the first ability alters the second ability. The second ability will not function properly if you don't make a choice with the first ability. So if you have a creature that is already in play, and you make it into a copy of Voice of All, it will not have protection, because no colour was chosen as it entered the battlefield, so of course it cannot have protection from the chosen colour. The weird part of this ruling is that only the linked ability can influence the other ability, and not other similar abilities. So for example, if a Vesuvian doppelganger comes into play, copying Voice of All, then the Voice of All's ability will cause you to choose a colour. The protection ability will function as normal, as long as the doppelganger remains a copy of the Voice of All, if the Vesuvian Doppelganger later becomes a copy of Quirion Elves, the ability tap to add one mana of the chosen colour will not work, even though a colour was chosen, because it was not chosen by the linked ability of the Quirion Elves. Wishes in subgames. A subgame is considered totally separate from the main game, so any card in the original game is considered to be outside of the game. If you use a wish, you can get a card from the original game, including cards from the battlefield or in your hand. Then, when the subgame ends, any cards that were brought into the game by Wishes, whether from the main game or from the sideboard, will be shuffled into your library for the main game. If you choose to get a card from the battlefield in the original game, any abilities that trigger on that permanent leaving the battlefield will go on the stack as soon as the main game resumes. Malira vs. Ink Moth Malira causes the opponent's creatures to lose infect, but it does not stop them from gaining infect, for example by animating an Ink Moth Nexus. In this case, the creature with infect will be unable to deal any damage to Malira's controller or any of their creatures, because its damage tries to place counters onto them, and Malira's effect prevents placing counters. Urtai's Meddling Urtai's Meddling is unusual, because it is the only effect that puts a spell onto the stack without casting it. This leads to some pretty weird rulings. Most obviously, it will not trigger any abilities that trigger when a spell is cast. It also will not count as your one spell for the turn if Rule of Law is in play, and an effect like Meddling Mage cannot stop it from being put onto the stack. 
because the spell is being put onto the stack directly instead of being cast, it will not check whether its target is legal when it is put onto the stack. However, it will still check whether its target is legal when it resolves, and if it's not, it will fizzle as normal. Another weird ruling is that if it is used on a morph spell that was played face down, when the spell is put back onto the stack, it will be face up, but it will be a colourless 2-2 creature with no abilities. Brothers Yamazaki vs Spy Kit It took me a while to figure out what this was even referring to, because Spy Kit specifically says the names of all non-legendary creatures, so it should not interact with the Brothers Yamazaki at all. However, the question was specifically in regards to what happens with these two cards plus Leyline of Singularity. So if there is a Leyline of Singularity in play, and you have two Brothers Yamazaki, one of which is equipped with Spy Kit, then you play another non-legendary creature, which, if any of these creatures, should be put into the graveyard as a result of the legend rule. Ultimately, it was ruled that as long as you have exactly two Brothers Yamazaki in play, the legend rule will completely ignore them when determining what needs to be put into the graveyard, and as a result you will not have to put any of your creatures into your graveyard. Turning things into artifact creatures. This is the only entry on the iceberg where I have absolutely no idea what it means. There are plenty of ways to turn things into artifact creatures, and I have no idea which of these it's talking about. If you know what this is about, let me know in the comments. First Striking Ninja The name of this entry is a bit misleading, because it's not actually the ninja that has first strike. If you attack with a creature that has first strike, and it isn't blocked, you can let it deal combat damage during the first strike damage step, and then put a ninja into play with its ninjutsu ability, and the ninja will deal damage during the regular damage step. If the ninja itself does somehow gain first strike, it will still deal combat damage during the regular damage step, because it did not deal damage during the first strike damage step. Zoetic Cavern versus Blood Moon. If Blood Moon is in play, it will prevent a face-down Zoetic Cavern from being turned face-up, because the resulting face-up permanent would not have the morph ability. Exiling an Exiled card. If an effect attempts to exile a card that is already exiled, it remains where it is, however it becomes a new object, which means that any other effects that have referenced it will lose track of it, so to speak. Clergy of the Holy Nimbus versus Weakness, obsolete ruling. Clergy of the Holy Nimbus has an ability that allows it to automatically regenerate when it would be destroyed, unless an opponent pays mana to stop this effect. If it was enchanted by an effect like Weakness, which lowered its toughness to zero, it would be destroyed due to having zero toughness. However, its ability would cause it to regenerate. It would then be destroyed again, and then regenerate again, and this would continue indefinitely until an opponent paid mana to stop it. If the opponent was unable or unwilling to pay the mana, this loop would continue indefinitely. However, at the time, the rule that a continuous loop causes the game to end in a draw did not exist. So the rules manager needed to come up with a solution to this. It was decided that the clergy would just continue regenerating indefinitely, while the rest of the game would go on as normal. The clergy would remain in play and tapped until either the weakness was removed from it, or an opponent finally paid the mana to prevent it from regenerating. The rules have since been changed, and now a creature that has zero toughness is not destroyed, but simply placed directly into the graveyard. Since this does not count as destruction, regeneration cannot prevent this. Buying your opponent a burrito as a win condition. This is a joke about an incident that involved pro player Luis Scott Vargas. Scott Vargas won a game in a Mythic Invitational tournament while eating a burrito. A clip of this event gained a lot of popularity on websites like Reddit and Twitter.
The Magic Esports Twitter account posted a tweet saying, quote, If you make top eight, celebration burritos are on us. Scott Vargas went on to make the top eight and did in fact get the promised burritos. This caused Reddit to freak out, claiming that the event had violated the tournament rules regarding bribery and wagering. However, the rules manager eventually stepped in and clarified that this did not in fact violate the rules on wagering. The step between turns. Obsolete ruling. For a brief period in Magic's history, there existed a step between turns. This step was intended to fix the functionality of the card Time Vault. The concept behind Time Vault is simple but it took them a while to get the functionality down. The people in charge of the rules didn't want players to be able to skip a turn that they had already begun, but equally they didn't want players to be able to just untap Time Vault whenever they wanted on the vague promise that they would skip a turn at some point in the future. The solution to this was to have a step immediately before the beginning of a player's turn, during which they could decide to skip that turn in order to untap the Time Vault. However, this step had an unintended consequence that enabled one of the most bizarre infinite mana combos ever. You weren't supposed to be able to play any abilities during the step between turns. However, at the time, the rulebook said that mana abilities could be played at any time, meaning that you could activate mana abilities in between turns. This was particularly useful with Wall of Roots, Because the step was between turns, the once per turn restriction did not apply to it. Also, state-based effects were not checked because no player should gain priority in between turns. So you could use Wall of Roots ability as many times as you like to generate an arbitrarily large amount of mana. This mana would not empty from your mana pool at the end of the step between turns. However, it would empty from your mana pool at the end of your untap step. And since you can't play spells or abilities during your untap step, all Wall of Roots could do on its own was cause mana burn damage to you. However, if you could skip your untap step with a card like Stasis, then you would have infinite mana during your upkeep that you could use to cast any spells or abilities you wanted. Pro Tour Honolulu This is a reference to a short story called Standoff in Honolulu. It's about a player with a Platinum Angel in play, refusing to follow a judge's orders. When the judge tries to give him a game loss for refusing to follow the game rules, he simply points to his Platinum Angel and says that he can't lose the game. It escalates from there. I'll leave a link to it in the description. It only takes a few minutes to read, and I think it's quite funny. Since this is the rules iceberg, I do have to be a spoil sport and point out that Platinum Angel does not prevent judges from issuing you with a game loss. Season of the Witch versus Silent Arbiter. At the end of the turn, Season of the Witch destroys any creature that could have attacked but didn't. However, it's not always clear what it means to say that a creature could have attacked. If you have two creatures in play, and your opponent controls a Silent Arbiter, only one of those creatures can attack, but either of them could have attacked. So the question is, should Season of the Witch destroy the one that does not attack? I actually couldn't find an official answer for this, but the general consensus seems to be that because the Arbiter's ability only allows one creature to attack, the other creature is considered to have been unable to attack, even though you could have attacked with it instead. Equinox Equinox is a really weird card, because it requires you to look into the future to see what would happen. To determine whether Equinox can counter a spell, you have to consider, if the targeted spell resolved right now, would it definitely destroy at least one land? If the answer is yes, then Equinox can counter it, and if it's no, then it can't. This means that Equinox cannot counter a spell that has a random chance to destroy a land, or that may destroy a land depending on what choices are made during resolution. Equinox cannot counter a Lava Blister, for example, 
because Lava Blister is not guaranteed to destroy the land. The land's controller could choose to have it deal 6 damage to them instead. The game rules don't allow you to ask them whether they will take the 6 damage or not during the resolution of Equinox, because they could change their mind after the Equinox is already resolved. Another really weird ruling is that if a land is also a creature, Equinox cannot counter a spell that would deal damage to that creature, even if the damage would be lethal, because the spell itself is not destroying the land, the lethal damage is destroying the land. Floral Spasm is still making a choice. This is a joke based on the original wording of the card. According to the original wording, Floral Spasm gets to choose whether to use its effect, not its controller. The wordings on older cards were much less formal and often quite inconsistent, but Floral Spasm is the only example of a wording that says that a card gets to make a choice rather than its controller. Red Elemental Blast has conditional speed, obsolete ruling. Back when interrupts still existed, the interrupt type was reserved for spells that could target other spells, while spells that could target permanents would generally be instants to allow for more interaction with them. Red Elemental Blast was one of a handful of cards that could target either a spell or a permanent. The ruling at the time was these spells would count as instants if they were played to target a permanent, and would count as interrupts if they were played to target a spell. Volrath Shapeshifter versus Dominating Lycid. If you control Volrath Shapeshifter, and the top card of your graveyard is Dominating Lycid, then the Shapeshifter's ability will of course give it all of the Lycid's text. It can activate the ability to become an aura, an enchanted creature. However, doing so will not allow you to gain control of the enchanted creature. This is because of layers. Control changing effects are in layer 2, while effects that change a card's text are layer 3. This means that Volrath's Shapeshifter does not gain the Lizard's control changing ability until after the game has already checked for any control changing effects. Note that this is different from using a clone to copy Dominating Lizard, because copy effects are layer 1. Therefore, the clone will gain the control changing ability before control changing effects are checked in layer 2. Comparing scenarios with Gitrog versus Titania. Both cards have abilities that trigger when a land is put into your graveyard. However, the Gitrog monster triggers when a land goes into the yard from anywhere, while Titania only triggers if it went into the graveyard from the battlefield. So the obvious difference is that Gitrog will trigger if you discard or mill a land card, but there are several other less obvious differences that occur due to the different way that the abilities are worded. Titania checks the characteristics of the card as it leaves the battlefield, while Gitrog checks as the card enters the graveyard. So if a face down Zoetic Cavern is destroyed, it will trigger Gitrog because it enters the graveyard as a land, but will not trigger Titania because it was not a land when it left the battlefield. Inversely, if you have a Shaya, Soul of the Wild, and a creature you control is destroyed, it will trigger Titania because it was a land when it left play, but will not trigger Gitrog because it was not a land when it entered the graveyard. Another important ruling is that if Titania is destroyed at the same time as a land, it will trigger, because cards that leave play at the same time see each other leaving. If the Gitrog monster is destroyed at the same time as a land, it will not trigger, because by the time that land enters the graveyard, Gitrog is also in the graveyard and therefore its ability will not trigger. Mutating Skullbriar if you mutate a Skullbriar, when the mutated creature dies, the counters can be divided as its controller chooses between the creatures that make up the mutated creature. They will stay on those cards in the graveyard. However, since the other cards no longer have the Skullbriar effect once in the graveyard, they will lose all counters if they move to another zone. Plus one plus one counters are not interchangeable. Obsolete ruling. 
Cards used to remember which effects place counters on them, and they could only be used for related effects. For example, Triskelion could only remove the three counters that it entered play with in order to do damage. If another effect put other plus one plus one counters on it, those counters could not be used to deal damage. Zero power Zilortha versus Trample. If a Zilortha with zero power is blocking a creature that has Trample, the controller of the creature with Trample can choose to assign zero damage to Zilortha and have all of the creature's power trample over to the defending player, since zero damage is enough to be considered lethal damage. However, Zilortha will not be destroyed unless at least one damage is assigned to it. Lazav versus Flip Cards this is not referring to double face cards, which are often colloquially known as flip cards. It is instead referring to the original flip cards from the Kamigawa block. If Lazav copies a flip card, it can flip and will act as the flipped side. If it then copies another creature after it is flipped, it will remain flipped. For most creatures, this is meaningless. However, if it copies another flip card, while already flipped, it will take on the characteristics of the bottom half immediately. Substance Substance was an ability that existed in some old editions of the rulebook. Substance was a static ability with no effect. No cards in the game naturally have the substance ability. It was created to fix the functionality of a few cards from Mirage. These cards are auras that have flash. However, if you played them at any time that you could not play a sorcery, they had to be sacrificed at the end of the turn. This was kind of a neat design, where you could play it as an aura for a permanent boost, or play it at instant speed as a combat trick. When they were printed, this was all fine. However, a later rules change made it so that at end of turn effects triggered before damage gets removed during the cleanup step. So if you were relying on a toughness boost from the aura to keep your creature alive, it would die when the aura was sacrificed before the cleanup step. To fix this, they made it so that the aura gained substance until the end of the turn, and then sacrificed it when it lost substance. Since until end of turn effects wear off at the same time as damage is removed, this restored them to their original functionality. However, it was since decided that they could just be worded to be sacrificed during the cleanup step. This would keep their original functionality without requiring the useless substance ability. Replacement Effects and Theros Gods The Theros Gods all have static abilities that make them not creatures while your devotion to their colour is less than a certain number. This has a really weird interaction with effects that apply to a creature entering the battlefield while the god is relying on its own contribution to devotion in order to make itself a creature. For example, your opponent controls Imposing Sovereign while your devotion to black is 4. You cast Erebos, God of the Dead. As Erebos enters the battlefield, it will not be a creature because your devotion to black is less than 5. Because it's not a creature, Imposing Sovereign's ability will not cause it to enter tapped, but then as soon as it enters the battlefield, it will add 1 to your devotion to black, bringing it up to 5, so then Erebos will be a creature. So the card goes from being a creature spell on the stack to being a creature on the battlefield, but is not a creature while it is entering the battlefield. Library of Lang and Rule 614.16. Rule 614.16 makes it so that replacement effects that care about effects, creating creature tokens, or placing counters on permanents will work with certain events that are not effects. Because Rule 614.16 specifically mentions tokens and counters, it does not apply to Library of Lang. So if something that is not an effect causes you to discard a card, that card cannot be placed on top of your library using Library of Lang's replacement ability. Sylvan Library versus Brainstorm. Sylvan Library references cards drawn this turn, which requires you to keep track of which cards you drew during the current turn. This is simple enough on its own, 
since you can just set aside all cards you draw while the library is out. But Brainstorm complicates this because it allows you to put cards from your hand on top of the library. In this case, you have two options. First, you can keep all the cards you drew this turn separate from the cards you had at the start of the turn. In this case, your opponent will know whether the cards that you put back with Brainstorm were ones that you drew this turn or not. This could potentially give them information about the contents of your hand. Or two, you can put all the cards together before putting them back, so your opponent will not know which cards you put back. However, this means if the Sylvan Library's ability later resolves, you cannot put back any cards that you drew before the brainstorm resolved. Infinite Wirefly Hive versus Leonin Elder. One player has a Wirefly Hive in play and some method of activating it infinitely, that is, infinite mana plus some way to untap the hive. The other player has Leon and Elder and is at some low life total. The question is, how many attempts is the Wirefly player allowed to make at generating enough tokens to kill their opponent before they get a warning for slow play? Each failed attempt causes the opponent to gain life, so the probability that the Wirefly player will be able to generate enough tokens to kill their opponent decreases rapidly. However, it never actually reaches zero. There's not really a definitive answer to this, but with a little math, we can calculate that if the Wireflies are destroyed, when the Leon and Elder player's life total is 8 or more, then there is less than a 1% chance that the Wirefly player can kill them. And this chance rapidly decreases even further for every point above 8 life that the Leon and Elder player is. This seems like a pretty reasonable stopping point. Getting a restraining order as a win condition. The Magic Tournament rules prohibit anyone from competing in the tournament if they are prohibited by law from entering the tournament venue. So getting a restraining order would force your opponent to leave the venue, therefore resulting in you winning by default. Building a Turing Machine. A Turing Machine is a simple computer consisting of an infinite array of cells, each containing a single character of information, and a read-write head that is able to move either left or right one cell at a time, along with a series of instructions to execute based on the state of the machine and the value of the current cell. Although this computer is extremely simple, it is capable of performing any function that any other computer can perform. A paper published in 2019 showed that it is possible to create a Turing machine within a game of magic using card effects. It uses creature tokens to represent these cells, with the tokens power and toughness representing its position relative to the read-write head, and its creature type representing the value stored in the cell. The value of the current cell is read by destroying the creature token, which will cause certain other abilities to trigger based on the creature type of the destroyed creature. The read-write head is moved left and right by placing plus one plus one counters and neg one neg one counters onto the tokens. A link to the full paper is in the description. Interrupting fork, obsolete ruling. Because of the way the batch system worked, the spell copy that was created by Fork used to resolve immediately as Fork itself was resolving, with no chance for either player to respond. This meant that it was impossible to counter the spell copy created by Fork, and you had to counter the Fork itself. You would have to do this before knowing which targets your opponent was going to choose for the copy. Also, because Fork itself was an interrupt, it could not be responded to by instance or activated abilities. This meant, for example, that a player could cast a spell like Lightning Bolt, retain priority, and immediately cast Fork on the Lightning Bolt. Their opponent would not have any opportunity to cast instance to protect their creatures, for example, by increasing their toughness or granting them protection from red. Discarding a Grandeur card to itself. There is a weird combo that allows you to discard a card with Grandeur to activate its own ability. It requires Words of Wind, Suppression Field, Chromatic Sphere, and any card with Grandeur. 
Here's how it works. Step 1. Activate the ability of Words of Wind. It creates a replacement effect that will apply the next time you would draw a card this turn. Step 2. Activate the Grandeur ability. Because of Suppression Field, this ability has a mana cost, so you have a chance to activate mana abilities. Step 3. Activate Chromatic Sphere's mana ability. It causes you to draw a card, but because of Words of Wind's replacement effect, you return a creature to its owner's hand instead. You choose your Grandeur creature. Step 4. Pay all the costs of the ability. This includes discarding the Grandeur creature that you just returned to your hand. Panglacial Worm versus Selvala. Panglacial Worm can be cast while searching your library, and Selvala's ability is a mana ability, so it can be used while you are casting a spell. It's possible, after activating mana abilities, that you do not actually have enough mana to cast Panglacial Worm, especially because you don't know how much mana Selvala's ability will generate until after it resolves. Because of this, the process of casting the spell is undone. Normally when this happens, any mana abilities that were activated to pay for the spell are undone too. But because Selvala had revealed information by causing players to draw cards, it can't be undone, so it remains tapped and the cards that the players drew remained in their hands. Where this gets really dodgy is that while you are searching your library, you can see what the top card is before deciding whether you want to attempt to cast the Panglacial Worm and activate Selvala. So if the top card of your library is a card that you want to get into your hand, you can attempt to cast Panglacial Worm, knowing that you will not have enough mana to cast it, just to get the top card from your library into your hand. I've heard a few people try to argue that this is cheating, but all of the actions performed are technically legal within the rules of the game. Dependency Loops If there are multiple effects that apply within the same layer, then normally they apply in timestamp order. That is, the one that entered play first applies first, then the one that entered play second applies, and so on. The exception to this is where the outcome of one effect affects the input of another effect, in which case they will be applied in dependency order. Say, for example, you have two copies of conversion in play. One, as normal, says all mountains are plains, and the other has been modified by magical hack, so that it now says all swamps are mountains. The mountain to plains conversion depends on the swamp to mountain conversion, so the swamp to mountain conversion will apply first, regardless of which order they entered play in. If we add another conversion and magical hack it to make all planes into swamps, we now have a dependency loop, because there is a group of dependencies where each effect depends on another. In order to break the loop, we simply apply the effects in timestamp order. So in this example, because the planes to swamp conversion entered the battlefield most recently, its effect will be applied last. All mountains and planes in play will become swamps. During the course of a game, a dispute that you cannot resolve by referencing the rules may occur. If both players agree, you can resolve the difference for the current game with a coin toss. This is a line from the original Alpha Edition rulebook. The rules in the early days of the game were not as rigorously defined as they are today. There are a lot of ad hoc rulings for specific card interactions. It was quite possible that a situation could arise which is not covered by the rules, and players needed a way to resolve it. Since the creators expected that the game would only be played in casual situations, solving these sorts of disputes with a coin toss was a reasonable solution at the time. Once formal tournaments started being held, the rules of magic needed to be much more rigorous and consistent. This really makes me appreciate all the hard work that has gone into writing the rules as they currently stand. It's good to know that any situation that arises in a game of magic can be sorted out. The rulings aren't always intuitive, as we've seen throughout the iceberg, but at least you can be confident that there is a definitive correct answer. Well, there we go. That's the entire magic rules iceberg explained. Thanks for watching, I hope you all enjoyed it. I haven't decided what my next video will be about, but it probably won't be magic related. 
I may do some more magic related content in the future, but if I do it probably won't be for a while. Hopefully some of you will stick around to see my other content, but if not, that's fine too. Oh well, I think that's about it. Bye.